G'day, g'day, and welcome to another episode of Tartarian Truthers with your host, Casey and Jojo. We have the best subscribers and interact almost daily with them on either Instagram or via email, but I'll have to be honest, I am terrible with getting back on email and Casey is the one that usually makes first contact. Thank you, friend. (laughs) Anyway, she alerted me of an email from a lovely Tartarian truther regarding Sydney's northern beaches. And to be honest, I really didn't think there was much old world architecture on the northern beaches, let alone manly. So we now know our new friend as Tartarian Tales. That is her handle, her Instagram handle. And this is what she wrote. So she wrote that she was born and raised on the northern beaches of Sydney and I'm excited to share with you my old world findings. I have been an avid truth seeker for as long as I can remember and even as a child I questioned the narrative. In all my research I had never heard of Tartaria and the mud flood until your channel suddenly appeared in my YouTube feed this year. It opened up a whole new rabbit hole for me which I love us too, and is another missing piece to the puzzle of our true history. I was surprised, delighted and saddened all at the same time to discover that Australia has so many wonderful buildings that were destroyed and it led me to think about the history of the northern beaches. When I read her email and I saw the attachments, links and all the incredible information that she had for us, I said, Jojo, I think you need to meet up with this woman. She sounds amazing. Yeah, you did. And she is amazing. And, you know, it really did spur us to delve a little deeper into this episode. So we decided to coordinate an excursion for two, which quickly grew to four. Um, Some call him Tim and Phoenix Flies Forever both joined us and they have helped us on so many other topics, sharing links whatever they see while they're out and about, you know, kind of boots on the ground type stuff. And can I just say, though, we had the best time finally being able to speak openly and freely about all the weird topics that come up without judgment. It was just so refreshing. I bet. Yeah, this is a, this is a picture of us at the beautiful Manly Beach on a cloudy, rainy day. Um, thank you, Tim. Um, I want to say thank you to your mum for tagging along and taking our group pics for us. She's awesome. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I saw your post on Instagram, actually, and I was so glad that you got to meet up with some of the best like-minded people and to explore Manly together. Just awesome, Jojo. And I was kind of jealous that you got to touch <laughs> Tim's beard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny, Casey. But you know what? It really was so fun to catch up with some like-minded folks, but why don't we get started? All right, let's do it. After getting that email from Tartarian Tales, we both started to do a little bit of research on Manly. And, you know, I noticed a lot of displaced looking people in the early photos. And when I reached out to Casey, she was telling me about a show that she'd just watched on YouTube on The Lost Generation. Yeah, that's right. And it led us both down a whole different rabbit hole. So according to Wiki, lost generation in this context refers to the disoriented, wandering, directionless spirit of many of the war survivors in the early post-war period. Interesting choice of words there. Disoriented, wandering, directionless. I mean, why were they considered lost when they were meant to be the products of the second industrial revolution? Many of these young boys barely coming of age were sent off to the war and also so many young fathers too. And many did perish. So the remaining children were likely to have been left with a loss of connection to their father's family's history. And then were more more often than not brought up in a single parent home of a grieving mother 
possibly enduring the ongoing anguish of intergenerational trauma. And we can only assume that their focus at the time was purely one of survival, meaning that it would have been very, very easy for these traumatized families to be manipulated and indoctrinated with the new narrative. Yeah, so in Australia, which had a relatively small population at the time, the death of 60,000 soldiers from World War I would have been catastrophic. I mean, that was potentially 60,000 children left without a father, but we'll never actually know the exact number of children affected or indeed the impact on the generations to follow. That's right. You know, the second industrial revolution, also known as the technological revolution, was said to have been a phase of rapid scientific discovery, standardization, mass production, and industrialization from the late 19th century into the early 20th century, which we found absolutely fascinating, since the vast majority of our old world structures were either constructed before 1883 or right between 1883 and 1900. Coincidence? I think not. I believe that our controllers were able to convince the lost generation or the inheritors, in our opinion, that all the brilliant structures around them were built by the generation before them. And why would they doubt it? I mean, why would they question it? It was before their time, so it was just what they accepted as the truth. Mm. So I guess the Western world only started to name generations from that point onwards. It's so strange. Like, who came before them? What were the generations before? Or did we only just start naming the generations after realising that there was such a vast disparity between the generations? Or perhaps it was engineered this way. Yeah, it's interesting, hey, and I'm guessing you're all wondering, what has this got to do with Tartaria Northern Beaches? Well, looking at early images of Manly, which was said to be established in the 1850s, you'll find some interesting anomalies in not just some of their structures, but also their people. I mean, look at these folks. Isn't it interesting that most pictures from this time period, from almost anywhere in the world, you will find the people dressed in the exact same attire and looking displaced, disoriented, wandering, almost directionless. Hmm. This is why I feel that our latest reset wasn't that long ago. And you know what, if you are interested to learn more about the lost generation, I highly recommend this episode by Shelley from There's No Place Like Home. It's definitely worth a watch. Okay, now for a little background on Sydney's northern beaches. So after only a few weeks of the arrival of the First Fleet, the 11 ships that departed from England in 1787 to New South Wales The Northern Beaches area was explored by Governor Arthur Phillip of the Royal Navy. The site, however, remained a rural location for the entire 19th century and early 20th century. The region only had a few small settlements located in the valleys between headlands. So, of course, there is a pre-Cook and, in this case, pre-Governor Arthur Phillip history. The early history of the Northern Beaches starts with Aboriginal inhabitants of the land, which is now known as the Northern Beaches. These early inhabitants were the Garigal people from the Eora Nation. The Aboriginal people thrived in this area thanks to the abundance of resources of the region, including fish, shellfish and animals. All over the coastal zone, researchers have found evidence of these in the middens. After only a few years of settling on the land, the Garigal people have mostly disappeared, primarily primarily due to an outbreak of smallpox in 1789. Some evidence of the Garigal people populating the area remains in the rock etchings that are currently located in Karingai Chase National Park. Wow, this is very sad. And, you know, we find this exact same story all over Australia. Hmm. But um, 
Do you know why Manly is called Manly, Casey? No, I don't actually. So according to the Dictionary of Sydney, its name comes from the confidence and manly behaviour of the Aboriginal people encountered there by Governor Arthur Phillip in 1788. Is a very interesting choice of name, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Moving on. So we met up at the Manly Town Hall, designed in the interwar striped classical style with Egyptian revival style columns by Samuel Reginald Macy. It replaced the previous town hall on the site, a Victorian mansion said to have been built in 1879. And get this. After being told that the area remained a rural location for the entire 19th century, here we have the original building, a very well-established Victorian mansion known as Langolan, not looking like a small settlement type structure to me. They say the council purchased the property for £5,000. However, the size and style of the building was too small and unsuited to the needs of the council and was demolished to make way for the new town hall. This is a new building, but my question is, why would they demolish a perfectly fine Victorian mansion to make way for this? Assuming there was so much land around, right? This gives me Masonic Lodge vibes. Just saying. Yeah, agreed. That flooring. Okay, what is going on in this image, Jojo? What is this place? (laughs) So this is the site of what once stood Daly's Castle, built in 1882 to 1883. But it was sadly demolished in 1939. And now... This excerpt from the Northern Beaches Library website. We recently told the story of Fairlight House, one of the grandest homes in Manly that was demolished in 1939. That very same year, another grand home was also lost. Picture this. One of the leading parliamentarians and barristers of New South Wales atop Manly's Constitution Hill in 1880, overcome with inspiration from the panorama of Manly Cove and Sydney Harbour, decides to build one of the grandest homes Manly ever saw. William B. Daly, QC, purchased a 0.4 hectare parcel of land known as Manly Heights and in 1882 to 83 began building his vision of Marinella, home by the sea. It was a Gothic revival castle like those in his Irish ancestral homeland. By 1884, Daly, By then, the New South Wales Attorney General was occupying his grand home. Wow. So after towering over Manly for 60 years, Daly's Castle was demolished in 1939. New laws to restrict residential flat buildings, which were introduced the following year, were too late to save the famous landmark. There was strong local opposition to the destruction of Marinella, including the Sydney Morning Herald, who called for the control of flats, denouncing the irretrievable damage caused by the destruction of romantic homes like Daly's Castle. The famous landmark was replaced by Housing Commission flats, named Marinella, and an original section of wall complete with gargoyles still stands above Sydney Road today. So we were just standing there and because there's five people just staring up at this wall, a passerby asked Tartarian Tales what we were looking at and she then said that she walks past this wall every day and had never looked up or even noticed the gargoyles or the stone. Wow, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that people just don't think about things in the same way that we do. No, they don't. And, you know, can you believe that they tore down that amazing castle to put in housing commission flats? Oh, I know. It's such a travesty. It's so disheartening to see so much destruction of our old world architecture. 
but I can almost see remnants of an event here, Jojo. I can see like a bit of melt, some straight lines. I mean, look at those layers. Do you think this was all part of, I, I don't know, like a cover-up of sorts? Mm, look, you know what? We could all see it. We could totally see it. And if they wanted to cover it up, you'd think they would have demolished the entire thing. Yeah, not leave those gargoyles there. Mm. Maybe someone just wanted to leave a little hint for us. Mm, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Did you guys go to Hogwarts? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? This is actually St. Patrick's College said to have been built in three years between 1885 and 1888. Wow, that is a spectacular building. Yeah, so we bumped into the custodian and I guess he now resides here at the college with some 200 students. Mm -hmm. Uh, he wasn't very happy about us being on the site and kicked us off um, from the side entrance, but he he let us come to the front kind of garden area where we could walk around and, and take some pictures, but he wasn't really keen on us going much further than sort of uh, where the path kind of ends right there, where those palm trees are. Uh, you can't really get a, a very good view of the sides or anything. No, that's all we saw. Cardinal Edward Clancy, Archbishop of Sydney, established the Seminary of the Good Shepherd in the Sydney suburb of Homebush in 1996. It serves men who are in formation for diocesan priesthood for the Archdiocese of Sydney and a number of dioceses from the province of New South Wales and beyond. This seminary continues the tradition of formation of priests that began at St. Patrick's College, Manly, from 1889. Though the first efforts at training priests in Sydney can be traced back to the 1830s under Archbishop Polding, the seminary opened in 1889 with 12 students. 12 students, are you serious? In this huge building? Mm -hmm. Yes, apparently. But also, Casey, check this out. Right behind this building is what they call the Cardinal's Palace. And they say it took 200 workers three years to complete both buildings. That's a huge complex for just 12 students. It is. And you know what, Jojo? This image here looks so similar to this aerial image of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Melbourne, don't you think? Mm hmm I wonder if St. Patrick's College is actually a renovated and repurposed old world cathedral and they've removed the spires. But I have been known to have a fantastical <laughs> imagination. <laughs> but you know what? I can totally see what you're saying. Yeah, it's pretty similar, huh? Mm, yep. Oh, hang on a second. Before we move on, what is that in the top left corner, Jojo? Hmm, let's have a look. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> it looks like it could, like, almost be the entrance to some underground bunker or something, doesn't it? Yeah, or well, maybe even the remnants of an older, st another structure maybe? Yeah. We what? I wonder if it's still there. Mm. If anyone mm. knows, if anyone's in that area and can see it, like, from their flat window, <laughs> 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 please leave us a comment below. It'd be interesting to know what mm -hmm. it is. For sure. Okay, so still on St. Pat's, let's have a look at these two images. So somebody had sent um, Tartarian Tales these pictures of a French ship that ran aground at Manly Beach in 1906 with St. Patrick's College in the background. These images are fascinating, Jojo, because if we're going with the official narrative, which we read earlier, it stated that the region had only a few small settlements at this time. So it's kind of random to build such a grand structure in such an isolated location for just 12 students. It actually seems bonkers when you think about it, doesn't it? It sure does. And look at these people. Did they come off the ship or... I don't know, were they wandering down to the beach to see the ship, you know, run aground? I don't know. Yeah. Looking quite displaced there, hey? 
they do look a little bit confused, don't they? Mm -hmm. And here is today, still towering over Manly, but surrounded by the brutalistic construction of the mid 20th century. Yeah, it's looking totally dwarfed by those ugly flats too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thanks, Lisa, for getting me these images, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> so now we're going to take a look at Long Gully Bridge. These old images. It's looking so majestic and old world here. We couldn't actually find any construction images of the bridge itself, just of the upgrade. But take a listen to this. So the Long Gully Bridge Suspension Bridge was built to encourage residential development at Northbridge and Camaray. It was built between 1889 and 1892, designed by Professor William H. Warren of the University of Sydney and J.E.F. Coyle, consulting engineer, and was considered one of the engineering wonders of Sydney. Poorly maintained, however, it was threatened with demolition in the 1920s and 1930s. In 1936, the bridge was closed to allow for the construction of a concrete arch to support the deck of the bridge, and it was reopened in 1939. It's now listed on the State Heritage and Conservation Register. Isn't that weird, Jojo, that just 30 years after it was built, it was already in a state of disrepair? It is very weird. And you know what, Casey? It's very similar to what we learn in our Macquarie Lighthouse and Mysterious Tunnel episode. It too was said to have been in a state of disrepair not long after it had been built. Either construction back in those days was terrible or these structures were actually much, much older than what we've been told. Yeah, it's mm. a bit sus, isn't it? And here we have um, an old picture. Look at this old postcard. And it's pretty funny because look at what they named it, Bridge Near Middle Harbour, as though they hadn't given it a name yet and later settled on Long Gully Bridge because they went, oh, look at that. That is a long gully, isn't it? We shall call it Long Gully Bridge. <laughs> so original. So original. Oh, dear. Right. Oh. Yeah. So what are we moving on to now? Bungan Castle. So building commenced in 1916 and completed by 1919 to 1920. This landmark along the north coast of Sydney remains a feature of Bungan Beach. Motoring around the coast from Manly, you see its incredible turret against the skyline in between Pittwater and Newport over Bungan Beach. It is built on the very pinnacle of the cliff. So, Casey, this looks like ruins to me. Yeah. The, you know, the remnants of two turrets. The rest may be still buried underground, perhaps. But allegedly, Bungan Castle was built in 1919 by Adolf Albers, on top of the Bungan headlands. He was a German artist and initially the home was built only as a weekender. They say the building was built from stone quarried from the site too. Yeah, I'm dubious. I think the best we could do was build that rickety picket fence, put on this sketchy tin roof <laughs> using the stones they found laying around. I mean, all for it a weekender, a private residence, and these out-of-place artefacts that were found inside, I mean, they're looking very medieval, Jojo. Hmm. And now this is a current image from today, and you can see they've added a chimney here, you know, looking quite dodgy, um, and that roof again along with the drain pipe, I mean... Sorry, sir, but I don't buy this story. <laughs> you look more to be renovating the remnants of a medieval castle, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, check these out. 
doesn't it look like they could be? <laughs> That's what's underneath. <laughs> oh, dear. There's our imagination again. Yes. <laughs> but seriously, it really does. So must I say the Northern Beaches seriously did not disappoint and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to unpack when it comes to the Northern Beaches that we couldn't fit it all into this episode. So we will definitely be revisiting uh, the Northern Beaches in the future. I would like to give a massive thank you to our new Tartarian truthers for taking the time out of their schedules to show me around Manly. I was seriously blown away. Tim, Lisa, Scotty, you guys were awesome and I look forward to many more adventures in the future. Yeah, it looks like you guys had a really great day and hopefully I'll be able to tag along to one of your catch-ups one day. Definitely, you certainly will be. And you know what, Casey? That brings us to the end of episode 22. Woohoo! Woohoo! We really hope you all enjoyed our take on the Sydney Northern Beaches and um, look forward to bringing you some other exciting episodes very, very soon. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>